So I want to say, first, thanks for having me here to present. Uh, the main question that we answer or present an answer for for this project is, does the 2012 stormwater manual make stormwater cost more or less than the 2005 stormwater manual? My name's Matt Fontaine. I'm a civil engineer with Herrera. And I want to start by thanking the rest of the project team. Um, the grant was funded, as Don mentioned, by a grant through the Department of Ecology, a grant of regional or statewide significance. The grant recipient is the city of Puyallup, and the Puyallup project manager is Mark Palmer, and then the primary grant partner is the Washington Stormwater Center, and Tanya Lee Irwin is the um, project manager for the Washington Stormwater Center. So thanks to the other members of the project team. Herrera is the technical, technical consultant on the project. Um, a lot of members on the team, but in particular I want to thank Megan Feller seated to my left. Uh, she was responsible for leading all of the hydrologic analysis that um, contributed to this project. So as I mentioned, the purpose of the project is to compare the cost of stormwater management under the 2012 manual with the cost for the same sites under the 2005 manual. And to do that, there's a few important steps that come up front, and the first one being developing example sites that are representative of the types of development that are happening and will happen in Western Washington. And the second one is to make sure, because the 2012 manual isn't implemented yet, is to try to understand how the manual will be implemented by jurisdictions in Western Washington and apply that implementation to our scenarios. And that will become more clear as we move forward. And before I get into the details, I also want to thank the members of the Technical Review Committee um, we established a small committee for this project to help um, determine how the sites should be developed in a way that's representative of development that's happening and will happen, as well as how jurisdictions around the region are going to implement the stormwater manual. So Chris May, Don Anderson, Mark Palmer, Tra Tracy Tackett, Merle Ash, Art Castle, and Eric Galimo, thank you for helping with this project. And here's an outline of the things we'll go through today. Um, starting with just a high-level summary of the manual revisions and how we address those revisions through our analysis, then get into the development examples we selected and costed out um, the assumptions and methods that went into our cost estimate. So how did we get from point A, just having some example sites, to point B, having some results, some BMPs that are sized appropriately, and cost estimates for them. So the quick manual refresher is here. Um, you can see the minimum requirements from the 2012 stormwater manual. The ones we're going to focus on during this presentation and throughout the analysis are the first one is preparation of the stormwater site plan. That's the design element of the project. Um, prevention of erosion during construction, the temporary erosion and sediment control, minimum requirement two. Then on-site stormwater management, that's where LID comes into play. Runoff treatment and flow control, um, no significant changes to those minimum requirements. And then finally, operations and maintenance. And these are all the elements that are addressed in the cost estimate, cost estimates for each scenario. So digging a little deeper into some of the more important minimum requirements for the analysis. Minimum requirement two, the one that deals with uh, construction site management, requires protection of LID BMPs. And those LID BMPs are now required in 2012 where feasible. Um, and th they can be either selected by looking at uh, two lists that are provided and selecting the first feasible BMP or alternative BMPs can be used to uh, meet the LID performance standard. And once the BMPs are in place, then comes the maintenance aspect of the project. And for this project, we looked at a 30-year cycle of maintenance, so the sum of the next 30 years of maintenance. Digging deeper into minimum requirement five, this, is, this slide illustrates how um, LID comes into play on each of our sites. All the lawn and landscape receives post-construction soil quality and depth, which is essentially tilling compost into the native soil. The roofs, um, going down through list two, we assume dispersion wasn't feasible, so the roofs are managed through downspout infiltration trenches or uh, bioretention facilities. And then all the other hard surfaces either are um, mimic this permeable pavement or, as bi or flow to bioretention. So the 14, 14 scenarios that we ran are based on three example sites. The first one is a single-family residential scenario. It's a 10-acre development divided into 44 parcels. The second one is small commercial. It's a one-acre 
lot intended to represent a typical fast food restaurant. The third one is a large commercial site intended to represent a strip mall or a big box store. Each of those example sites was costed under both the 2005 and the 2012 manual. The residential scenarios were also costed based on a regulatory standard we're calling the 2012 manual with LID principles. The LID principles are intended to represent um, the future where jurisdictions have evaluated their code to incorporate LID principles, including reducing the amount of impervious surface. So essentially it results in smaller, more dense lots and more of the site can be preserved um, or developed into other lots. So we combine the sites with the standards and then combine all that with two different soil types, outwash and till soils. And in tabular format, there's one handout for today, and that is, it looks like this. I don't know if you, if you didn't grab one as you walked in, um, we'll show this table a bunch more times as we go through. So I think um, you'll be able to follow even if you don't have one with you. So on this graphic you can see, um, working from top to bottom, We've got our scenario numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. The first six are residential, and we break those out, um, 2005 manual, 2012 manual, 2012 manual with LID principles, and then we have the soil types, outwash till, outwash till, outwash till. Till's all shaded gray. When we get into comparing the results, we'll be comparing the white boxes with the white boxes, the gray boxes with the gray boxes. So now on to the small commercial, scenario seven through 10. Uh, the same breakdown, seven is 2005 outwash, eight is 2005 till, um, et cetera. And then large commercial, exactly the same breakdown, the next 11 through 14 scenarios. Now jumping ahead to the results of the project, um, before I tell you how we get from point A to point B, so we can see that some of the scenarios end up costing more under the 2012 manual. Um, and most of the commercial ones actually wind up costing less. So how do we get there and what assumptions come into play and influence these results? First, I want to um, illustrate what the example sites look like. Here's the single family residential. Um, symbology that's typical across all these graphics. Parcel boundaries are shown in red. Lawn landscape's green. The building is apparent in all the parcels and commercial sites. For the typical single family residential, without LID principles, we're looking at a 7,500 square foot average parcel size and almost 3,000 square feet of total impervious on the parcel. Then when we move over to LID principles, each parcel gets smaller. Um, total impervious reduces to just under 2,500 square feet and the average parcel size reduces to 5,000 square feet. So that you can see it leaves about 4.2 4 acres that could be developed in other parcels, it could be preserved in forest. Um, there's several things that a developer could decide to do. Now onto the small commercial site. Uh, it's one acre and 30, over 35,000 square feet of that is impervious surface. And the large commercial is 10 acres. Again, it's mostly impervious surface, both roof and parking lot. So a lot of assumptions went into evaluating these sites. The first one is that they're all new developments. So they all trigger minimum requirements one through nine. Um, that the sites are constrained along the sides that we can't have full dispersion. There isn't space to preserve 65% forest to, the, to a 10% impervious ratio. And then finally that infiltration is feasible on all the sites. Other things related to soils, uh, outwash, we assumed didn't meet the suitability requirements for treatment. Um, that we do have adequate depth to groundwater in all the sites and that the infiltration rates for till are, the native infiltration rates are 0.3 and 6. Um, and we apply correction factors for site variability, uh, materials, and maintenance to get, and for testing, to arrive at the infiltration rates shown. And I won't read through them, but you can see them here. Um, reduced from the native infiltration rate. So the TRC input was really important in making sure that our lot layouts and our right-of-way layouts were representative of typical zoning codes and things that might change in the future as LID principles get incorporated into local code. Um, for example, the residential right-of-way for our typical residential scenario 
was 50, uh, 50 feet across. That's two sidewalks, two planting strips of both of five feet each, two travel lanes and one parking lane. Um, and that slims down under the LID principles. We cut out one sidewalk, so there's a single sidewalk. Um, and we also remove the parking lane and the parking is provided as one stall per four dwelling units within the planting strip. Okay, other typical site conditions that um, affect or manual implementation issues that affect our costs. The first one ends up being a significant factor in the residential and that's that um, stormwater management BMPs in the right of way can only manage right of way runoff. So that means that a bioretention facility within the right of way doesn't manage runoff from private parcels. All the private parcel runoff winds up being managed in centralized facilities at the downstream end of the development. Um, also that the surrounding stormwater system invert depth was four feet. That restricts the depth, of, depth and type of BMPs that are available for each site. Um, and that we will have uh, permeable pavement on outwash, but with a treatment soil layer. And then that the analysis can incorporate proprietary stormwater BMPs if it makes sense from a cost or feasibility standpoint. And then finally, again, related to cost, that we will have um, facilities will be below ground when the land value dictates that they're underground. So these are all, um, the top ones are more related to how jurisdictions foresee implementing the 2012 manual, whereas the bottom ones are more um, other ground rules that we established for the study. Now into the methods. So the modeling was performed using MGS flood, um, using an average precipitation of 44 inches. The pavement sections for both pervious and impervious were based on the washed up pavement policy, and consideration was given to um, the structural section as well as the hydrologic demand for the site and for that, that was indicated by the modeling. The conceptual designs for each site included temporary erosion and sediment control plans, um, on-site stormwater management BMPs, runoff treatment, flow control, and then finally design as well as operations and maintenance. So these are all the components that go into our cost estimates. For cost estimating purposes, we developed um, standardized unit costs that were based mostly on historic bid-based references and then also on cost-based based unit costs where we developed engineers' estimates that incorporated labor, equipment, material. Um, I should point out that most of the unit costs are based largely on public project bid tabs, which is the most readily available data source. Um, private is just much less available, so we have fewer of those incorporated into the unit costs. So here are the operations and maintenance costs we assumed for each of the sites based on um, references that we collected. The bioretention, you can see, the one, I'm going to point out the ones that have a significant impact on the overall result. And that is bioretention at $21 per square foot. That includes a higher level of maintenance initially and then a lower level of maintenance over the longer term. We have 27000 almost 28000 um, for stormwater treatment planter vaults. That includes replacing the mulch uh, regularly and then replacing the media every 10 years. You can see permeable pavement, permeable sidewalks, also a high cost, $15 per square foot. And that assumes, I know a lot of people around the region saw, witnessed um, the bird demonstration. So that assumes something like that is happening on a semi-regular basis. And then permeable pavement and impermeable pavement. We have, um, we're using the same maintenance cost for those two types of surfacing, and that's because the permeable pavement standard right now is to do um, regenerative air sweeping every two times per year. Um, a lot of properties are already being swept more often than that, so that's something to keep in mind when you see the operations and maintenance totals that we're not assuming a greater cost for permeable pavement. So jumping into the results now. So we we'll start with the six residential scenarios. And I'll go through each one explaining the BMPs that were selected and sized as well, and then finish with a cost table that summarizes each, each segment, so each example site, first single family, then commercial, then large, then large commercial. 
So here's the parcel layout for scenario one. Um, downspout infiltration trench is used to manage roof runoff, and we have soil quality and depth to manage the lawn and landscape. And then looking at this from a parcel standpoint, so here's where the individual parcels comes in, I, sorry, from a development standpoint. We have traditional pavement, we have soil quality and depth around the perimeter, um, and we have a centralized facility at the downstream end of the development. And so just showing the flow path on this first slide, um, and for the rest of the single family residential development scale figures, this is the same, the flow path is the same, so I won't illustrate it on every one. So flow is going from these private parcels into the right of way down to the centralized facility for each of these residential examples. So scenario two, um, and one thing I should also point out, at the bottom of each of these we have, each slide we have the scenario number, the type of development, the manual requirements, and then the soil type, just for reference if, and also you can reference the handout also has that information on it. So for scenario two, we're still in the 2005 manual, now we're till soils. We have downspout dispersion instead of downspout infiltration. Soil quality and depth is the same. Um, and on a development scale, it's the same, except now we have a combined detention and wet pool facility that takes up four parcels as opposed to two that were taken up in the previous example. Scenario three, now we're into 2012. We've got full infiltration for the roofs, soil quality and depth, so no change here from the 2005 manual. When you look at the right of way, there are significant changes though. We've got permeable sidewalks. We have bioretention managing the right of way runoff from, from, the, from the road. And then that reduces our centralized facility down to only occupy one parcel. And that's exclusively there to manage excess runoff from the private parcels. So excess runoff from these lots because the surfaces aren't all managed on the parcel. Scenario four, now we're into 2012 until. So the roof is managed with bioretention. We have soil quality and depth again and permeable pavement for the driveway. And then looking at it at the development scale, we have permeable pavement on the roadways. And then the centralized facility occupies only three parcels. So you can see the centralized facility has come down one, one parcel worth of footprint from the 2005 examples. Now looking at the LID principles examples, we've got, again, these are exactly the same as the as scenarios three and four. They're just smaller. So all the facilities are smaller. Again, full infiltration, soil quality and depth. We've got bioretention uh, because it's outwash. And then we have a one parcel worth of centralized facility at the end. Scenario six, again, LID principles, till. And we have bioretention to manage the roof, soil quality and depth to manage the lawn and landscape and pervious pavement throughout the whole site. Um, the combined detention and wet pool facility here takes three parcels as well, but they're smaller parcels. So this table, um, I use the same table format for each of the example sites to describe where the costs are higher and the reasons why. So you can see on the left hand side we have each of the cost components that we mentioned earlier. In the methods section we have Erosion and sediment control, on-site stormwater management, that's where the LID comes into play. Uh, treatment and flow control, BMPs, design, operations and maintenance. Design does include the geotechnical evaluation as well. Um, so going through the individual scenarios, starting with three and four, I'll cover them both at once because the um, pluses and minuses are the same across when we compare. Remember, we're comparing three to one and then four to two. So the TESC cost goes up, and that's because we're protecting the LID BMPs during construction. And for that, we're assuming we're doing some out-of-phase excavation where those LID BMPs are sited. The on-site stormwater management cost goes up, and that's because of the additional LID BMPs. Uh, one thing I should note here is for both the single-family residential and the large commercial scenarios, these include, these costs that you see, they're large, they include the road surfacing. Because we're looking at LID and looking at permeable pavement, we need to compare apples to apples. So we're comparing traditional pavement to pervious pavement across the entire site. Treatment and flow control costs go down. LID BMPs reduce the overall cost of the treatment and flow control centralized facilities. 
Design costs go up, uh, largely due to the geotechnical evaluation, as well as design of additional BMPs. And then operations and maintenance go up, and the main cost components driving the cost up are the bioretention maintenance and the permeable sidewalk maintenance. The 2012 is lower when it comes to parcels lost um, relative to 2005. Each 2012 scenario loses one less parcel. So we're evaluating that at $150,000 per parcel. When you look at the overall cost, it's about 25% greater for the two 2012 scenarios. Uh, if you take out operations and maintenance, then the costs are more comparable. And I won't spend a lot of time on the LID principles example. The, you know, the BMPs are all the same as scenarios three and four. The main difference is that everything's smaller. So all the costs shift down, and in some cases, those costs are now lower than the 2005 examples. Um, you can see that the cost shifts down to around 10% lower for these scenarios um, without, with O&M, and then a little bit even lower when you take O&M out. And one additional thing to point out for the single-family residential scenarios, um, we design these per list two to illustrate what the LID BMPs will cost. We wanted to illustrate what it will cost to put bioretention at residential uh, scale sites. But if you look at the flow duration plots for scenario four, that's so now we're back to 2012 um, and till soils. We have bioretention managing the roof. So you can see in this plot, let's just go over what the plot represents. Um, the green line and the red line green line represents the pre-developed and the red line represents the developed um, and the optimum solution would have those lines pretty much converged because that means you're not wasting you know wasting any cost on BMPs flow control portion of the plot is this upper part the LID performance standard is down here the lower portion of the plot you can see we're exceeding by quite a bit when you look at the LID performance standard portion um, we remove the bioretention we're still meeting the flow control portion, take that off. Uh, we're still meeting the flow control portion, but you know, we're and we're still exceeding the LID performance, just not as much. So, what we're show, what I'm showing here is that we don't need the bioretention facilities in order to meet both the flow control and the LID performance. So, if we take those costs out, that reduces our cost by 300, almost 300,000 for that scenario, including construction and operations and maintenance. So then we're down to 13% greater than the 2005 scenarios, which brings it, you know, brings it down from 26 to 13 percent. Okay, now into small commercial. Starting with 2005 and outwash, we have um, downspout infiltration to manage the roof runoff. We have infiltration trenches for flow control from the parking lot and stormwater treatment planter vaults to, to provide runoff treatment. Moving into outwash, we no longer have the trenches. Now we have a large detention tank. We're moving into till. And then under the 2012 manual um, for outwash, we're able to provide minimum requirement 5, 6, and 7 for the parking lot just with these bioretention facilities. Um, we don't wind up needing any centralized stormwater management facilities. For scenario 10, when we switch over to till, we still have the bioretention to provide to meet minimum requirement five, but in this case, it doesn't meet minimum requirement seven for us, so we still have a large detention tank. And then back to one of these tables on the left hand side, we have all the cost components TSC on site, flow control, design, OM, and we're comparing whites against whites and grays against grays here again. So for TSC, um, under 2012, they go up just a small increment to protect those bioretention facilities. On-site stormwater management goes up quite a bit because of the bioretention facilities. But the flow control and treatment goes down a lot for Scenario 9. And significantly for Scenario 10, it's cut almost in half relative to Scenario 8. For the design, the cost is going up because we're doing additional geotechnical evaluation. And then the operations and maintenance is actually going down because of the bioretention cost relative to the stormwater treatment planter vault cost. And then finally, the, the final result is that the costs are 
36% lower for scenario nine when compared to scenario seven, and then 20% lower when we compare scenario 10 to scenario eight. And if you take out the operations and maintenance, um, scenario 10 goes up just a little bit above the 2005 scenario, but scenario nine is still significantly lower. So now moving from small commercial into large commercial, now we're back to big box stores, strip malls. So here we have 2005 outwash. So we're using, similar to the small commercial, we've got downspout infiltration to manage runoff from the rooftop. We have a big infiltration trench at the downstream end of the site. And we have stormwater treatment planter vaults scattered throughout the site to provide treatment. And if we switch that over to till, we get rid of the infiltration trench. We still have the stormwater treatment planter vaults and instead of um, the infiltration trench, we have a detention tank. When we move into 2012, we incorporate permeable pavement um, and that's all we need. Permeable pavement will meet minimum requirement five, six, and seven for the site. And the same is true with till, which just has a thicker gravel reservoir course and we also included an overflow within the base course to prevent water from sheet flowing out into the street in the case that you know, the 25 year storm or the design storm is exceeded. So this table one more time, we have the TSC cost being higher because we're protecting the permeable pavement base throughout the construction period. On-site stormwater management costs um, going up and that's the difference between doing the permeable pavement versus traditional pavement. We have no treatment and flow control costs for the 2013 and, or for the scenarios 13 and 14. And we have reduced design and operations and maintenance cost as a result of not having those um, permanent treatment and flow control facilities. And the costs go down significantly uh, between scenario 13 and 11, we're looking at a 40% reduction. Between 14 and 12, we're looking at a 47% reduction. And that's largely due to the, uh, primarily, almost exclusively due to the fact that we don't need the treatment and flow control facilities. Now, if you take operations and maintenance out and just look at the construction cost, we're still 21% and 29% lower, so still significantly lower. So just to recap some of the factors that have affected the results of this analysis, for all the private, um, private single family residential developments, because we assume that right of way couldn't be managed, or runoff from the private parcels couldn't be managed in the right of way, we needed to have centralized facilities and all those LID scenarios, scenarios three through six. Um, but we could feasibly have managed the runoff in the right of way, eliminated those centralized facilities, and then had more parcels to develop. So that's one thing that skews the results a little bit towards the 2005 scenario, scenarios one and two. Um, and as I illustrated with the bioretention example, we're designing those residential sites to list two, so we could illustrate what those BM, uh, LID BMPs did cost. Um, and that increases the cost for some of them. So from a design standpoint, important to consider the performance standard whenever you're evaluating um, a design per the 2012 manual. Um, the depth of the municipal storm sewer has an effect on which BMPs can be chosen. So it's important to consider that when looking at sites. And then land value also affects from a from a private development standpoint, it affects, or single family development standpoint, it affected the costs for the scenarios that had more developable, developable parcels. From a commercial standpoint, it affected the choice of BMPs. For those large commercial sites, we chose to have underground facilities because we assumed a high value of commercial land that's typical throughout Western Washington. Um, o and unit costs I showed earlier have an impact, you can see how the percentages change when we toggle O&M in and out of the total costs. And we also didn't incorporate operations and maintenance for lo the lawn and landscape. Um, if you think about a, any of the cases where we have bioretention, they're replacing what would otherwise be a lawn or a landscape. So the net difference probably isn't as great as we are showing with, our, with the unit costs that we're using. And then just taking you back with a re recap through all the example sites one more time. Uh, single family residential are more expensive. Protection of LID BMPs during construction. We've got additional geotechnical evaluation that happens during the design phase. The LID BMC BMPs themselves cost more. 
then we have to maintain the bioretention and the permeable sidewalks. Um, and for the examples with LID principles, the smaller lot size and narrower right of way make those costs lower. For the small commercial scenario, the big, the big deal for scenario nine on outwash with the 2012 manual is that bioretention is able to meet minimum requirements five, six, and seven. So that you know, eliminates the need for centralized facilities. That reduces the construction design and O&M cost. Um, the till primarily just has a lower O&M cost for the small commercial scenario. And then when we look at the large commercial site, um, similar to scenario nine, um, scenarios 13 and 14, minimum requirements five, six, and seven are all met by permeable pavement. So that reduces the design costs, the operations and maintenance cost, as well as the construction cost. And so returning to where we started this all, we've got, just to recap, single family residential costing more for some of the scenarios, uh, commercial, bulk of the commercial scenarios costing less. So I guess the result is that the 2012 manual, depending on the assumptions and the site conditions that go in to the individual project, um, the costs are comparable and they can go in either direction. The 2005 manual could be greater in some cases, 2012 manual greater in others.